So, uh, um, like I said, you know, our family, as you well know, is committed to uh, liberty. I know that my brother is absolutely committed to liberty. The thing that's unique about him is that he's also very capable and willing to go out and fight. So it's a, a very unique combination of having the commitment as well as the capability to go out. And I wouldn't have anybody else right now in that position besides my brother. So at this, at this point, I'd like to introduce my brother, the second best golfer in our family, Ram Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know if he, uh, I didn't get to hear the whole introduction, so I don't know if he told the truth or not. <laughs> and with your brother, that's important, you know. So if he, if he told you that he was a better golfer, that's sometimes true. So, but uh, thank you, Ronnie, for the introduction. And uh, does anybody remember Charlie Sheen when he was kind of going crazy last year? And he's going around, jumping around, saying, winning, winning, we're winning. Well, I kind of feel like that. I, I think we are winning. <laughs> and I'm not on any drugs. I just think we're winning. And I, I think we really are. I mean, last week we had an extraordinary week. Um, for, the, for a change, you know, for, and I think quite unusual in the last century, the president came to Congress and said, we need congressional authority to go to war, and we're going to have a debate. And what's extraordinary about it is when you have a debate, people actually do debate the pros and cons. Typically what we've had in the past, and we still have many people, they start with a conclusion. Their conclusion is, well, this is in our national security interest. And it's kind of like, well, aren't we going to have the debate whether it's in our national security interest? They start with a conclusion. And so we never really have this debate, and often that comes after the bombs have been dropping. We begin dropping the bombs, and then we say, what's well, in our national security interest? The president came and had lunch with us this week, and one of the things he said, which he hasn't always stuck to, I don't believe, but he said, well, if, if there isn't an imminent threat to the country, we have to ask for congressional authority. So I asked him, well, is this verdict, if we vote no, is this going to be a binding verdict? And he kind of bobbed and weaved a little bit, and he said, well, you know, uh, but he, he kind of indicated it was, but he indicated it was different than Libya. I think they're kind of the same thing, but I think what's important is that we did have a debate, and one of the reasons Madison said we ought to have the debate is when you have a debate, it makes you less likely to go to war. doesn't mean you never go to war. There have been times in our, in our history we've been fairly unified. When the Japanese attacked us on December 7th, 1941, we were fairly unified that we weren't going to take it, and we were going to respond, and we declared war. 9-11, I think we were fairly unified as a country, too, when we were attacked. So I think there are times when we are attacked that we can be unified, and when we aren't attacked, when we decide we're going to get involved because we say, well, American interest exists, well, you have to prove that, and you have to have a debate, and that's why it's important. If we take imminent threat off the table, we say, well, we're imminently going, being attacked or under attacked or under siege or people attacking us, you can respond. But when that isn't occurring, which is most of the time, and the president admitted this as much in his remarks to us, he said, a lot of these things are ambiguous. Yeah, well, when it's ambiguous, we ought to have a debate because then you have to prove to us, you have to prove that there's a compelling American interest in Syria. And as you all know, it's a pretty messy war over there. In all likelihood, Assad gassed his people. Doesn't make any sense why it would, but in all likelihood, all the evidence they give me shows that he did. But on the other side, you have Islamic rebels who uh, enjoy publicly videotaping beheadings and showing you know, what great people they are by chopping the heads of their victims off, or in other instances, eating the heart, or actually, what I love about PolitiFact is these, these different news organizations that claim they're monitoring the truth, that they said, no, 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 that wasn't his heart, that was his liver. It's like, I told my staff to send them back a tweet, and they won't, sometimes my staff won't tweet exactly what I want to tweet. So I told them to send back a, a tweet saying, you know, I've seen my fair share of hearts 
livers and kidneys, if they want to have a contest, we'll bring them in and we'll have some gross pathology. We'll have the organs on the table and we'll see who's better at identifying a heart from a liver. As if they were questioning, oh, it's all, it's no, it's okay. He was only eating the man's liver. He wasn't eating the man's heart. No big deal. But really, there's atrocities occurring on both sides of this war, and the people who attacked us on 9-11 are on one side of the war, and they would be encouraged by destabilizing Assad. So I think really, for the first time, we had something extraordinary happen, that we had a debate, and I think we won the debate. We really won the debate. The Overwhelmingly, people opposed this war. I gave a speech last night, and it was on foreign policy, and there were 200 young people who work on the Hill. And it was supposed to be a debate where people were debating back and forth. I was introducing it, and then there was going to be a debate on both sides of whether we should be involved in Syria. So I thought maybe the crowd would be a mixed crowd, and I said, well, I'm going to start out, and I'll poll the audience. How many people here think it's a good idea to bomb Syria? Now, here I think I probably wouldn't get many hands. I didn't get any hands. Not one young person raised their hand. I said, well, whoever's on the debate side that's going to convince these people to bomb Syria has got their work cut out for them. But that's true of the phone calls. We got thousands and thousands of phone calls, virtually no phone calls in support of being involved. And it's not that we're not sympathetic. It's not that we don't think it's horrific what's happening to those people. But you have to ask yourself, if you bomb Assad, is it more or less likely that he uses more chemical weapons? Well, John Kerry came to our committee and he says, I guarantee you he's more likely to do it if we don't bomb him. Well, I don't know. He already acted pretty irrationally if he bombed his own citizens when he knew it would encourage the rest of the world to get involved. That's behaving pretty irrationally. So do you think if we bomb him, he might launch bombs on Israel or Turkey or Jordan? The other th reason they say we should be involved is because there's a half a million refugees in Jordan. I ask the question, is it more or less likely there'll be more refugees in Jordan if we bomb them? I think more likely. I mean, we're going to scare the heck out of people, and they will flee when the, when the war escalates. And then the other question, and this is, a, a, you know, they think it won't happen, but it could happen. Is it more or less likely that Iran or Russia become more involved in this, or that this escalates to a regional war if we get involved? Well, Iran and Russia are already involved. We're already involved as well. But I think it's more likely that it escalates if we get involved. The best course here really is a diplomatic solution, and I'm, I'm hoping we're heading towards it. Now, I'm not naive enough to say, oh, well, you know, Putin, we can trust him every time, and we can trust Assad. I, I think that isn't likely, but I think that Assad is, is feeling the pressure from his own civil war, and that there is a reasonable chance that we may. Now, I saw somebody from uh, Dan, I think it's Dan Mitchell from Cato, was on uh, the television tonight, and they were asking him about, uh, you know, Assad says we should pay a billion. We should pay him a billion dollars to get rid of the weapons. And Dan Mitchell's response was pretty good. He said, "Why don't we just give him Obamacare?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to punish him, if you want to make, you know, if we want to punish him, let's just extend Obamacare to Syria. Um, but I think we're winning on Syria. I think we're winning on just about every other issue that's come forward in, in the last six months to a year. On the NSA, you know, the idea of whether or not the Fourth Amendment thinks you can look at any kind of records. The interesting thing is, and some people don't realize this, and you need to realize this, is because this is how far and how bad this is, is actually Supreme Court precedent does support what they're doing. You say, no way. It does. The Supreme Court in the 1970s, in a case called Marilyn Smith and another one called, I think, U.S. Government versus Miller, said that third-party records don't have any protection of the Fourth Amendment. Now, I think these are wrongly decided, but this needs to go before the Supreme Court. We're pushing to get the case. We're working with the ACLU and other organizations to get this before the Supreme Court, because really, your third-party records should. It's become, you have more third-party records now that you have everything digitalized and on the internet, but it, it, I think it was important then and wrongly decided, but now I'm thinking maybe they'll revisit it, new courts say new things, and I'm hoping they will. Because the way I look at it is, I buy almost everything on Visa. I don't carry any money around, so if you're gonna rob me, forget about it. I don't have any money. But I do have a Visa, and I use it for everything. But the thing is, is if you look at my Visa transactions, you can say, does he go to a psychiatrist? Not yet, maybe soon, but <laughs> do I gamble? Not that much, but uh, you could see if I gamble on my visa, if I charge my visa, you can tell if I drink, do I smoke? 
do I read Reason Magazine or do I read Free Market Economics? Yes, I mean, but the thing is, it's none of your business unless I care to tell you or unless I've been accused of a crime or unless a judge gives you permission to look at my records. But the way it sits now is once Visa has those records, they're held by a third party and the courts have judged that I gave up my right to have possession or to have privacy. My expectation of privacy is gone. This came up recently with the FBI. They were getting ready to get a new director and I was holding up this process because I wanted to know whether or not uh, they were gonna get warrants to use drones domestically. And they said they were already doing it. So they did divulge to me how many times, and I can't remember whether it's classified or not, it's kind of stupid, whether it's 30 or 40 or 20, that's a classified number. And I can't remember which it is, so I'm not divulging a secret, but it's somewhere in there. <laughs> but uh, they are using drones, and they haven't had to get a warrant, according to them, because they haven't seen the need to get a warrant yet. Because, But they did say, if uh, there was a reasonable expectation of privacy, they would get a warrant. And I, those are legal terms, and I'm sure those are in the court cases. And so I wrote him back another letter, and I asked, well, what, what does that mean? What is a reasonable expectation of privacy? And they said, well, the court so far, and they went through a list of court cases, so I'm glad I got the letter back from them. But they went through a, a series of court cases, and they said, well, at this point in time, the courts have ruled that surveillance from a manned aircraft doesn't require a warrant, so therefore we don't think surveillance from an unmanned aircraft requires a warrant either. So basically they don't think they need a warrant to use drones anywhere in America. And this is a real problem and something we need to revisit and need to look at because we now have drones that are the, the size of a mosquito. We have drones that can fly up and stick to your window and look inside your house. Are they saying they need no warrant for that? My guess is they won't say that, but we really need to figure this out in advance of, of the surveillance coming to our house. And so, but I think the American public is with us. But we have to get, I think your legislature and your court system and all of this lags 10 years, 20 years behind the people. What we need to do is get to a point where things are getting caught up and we are the ones that are winning. I think we are winning in the sense that the public is with us. It's not just us, it's just not the remnant or the hardcore, but I think the public is in general with us on these issues. I think also from a partisan point of view as a Republican, these are ways we grow the Republican Party. When you say you're for the right to privacy, I think we expand who we are as a Republican Party. We bring new people in. I always tell people, it's like, they, it's like President Obama won all the young people. He got 70% of the young, the youth vote. And it's like, well, you know, he's losing it right now through a lot of this. But if we want to get the youth vote, it, it's not like we have to change our message, but they don't care so much about taxes or regulations. They don't have much money to care about. But they've all got a cell phone. They're all on the internet. They do care about whether the government should be looking at their every search on the internet or listening to their phone calls or recording their phone records. And so I think this is something we, that can appeal to, to, to young people. The, the youth numbers for president in the last month or two have gone down 20 points. You know, so he really is losing the youth over this issue. If we want a transformational event, a transformational election where Republicans become the dominant party, we could become the right to privacy. We could become the, private, the party of privacy, the party that doesn't believe in big government surveillance. If we do that, and you could see the opposite happening, you could see the Democrats nominating somebody who becomes a candidate who is this candidate, who's for, you know, who's, who's been the most aggressive for being involved in Syria? Hillary Clinton. Who's probably the least likely to protect your privacy among Democrats? Hillary Clinton. So you could see them nominating somebody who really becomes, you know, you can see the, the whole entire youth vote could switch if we know what we're doing. As far as other issues that we're winning on, you know, tapping reporters. I think finally we're getting some fair reporting of this president because for the first time they're seeing that he's tapping their phones too. So we, when you see the Associated Press complaining, and then you see Fox, Fox News didn't take too much for it to get them to complain. But when you see, when reporters see that he's spying on their activities, when he's abusing his power of office, maybe we're getting a change. One of my favorite examples of how the media treated the press, how the, how the press treated Obama in the beginning was, there was this John Stewart clip and they had a fake reporter, you know, talking to Obama, and um, the reporter was asking him a question and then secretly trying to touch his cloak to get a miracle. And uh, 
they treated they treated him as if he could do no wrong. And really, he was treated with kid gloves. He didn't get any hard questions, I don't think. But I think some of that's changing now, and some of that's changing as uh, we're seeing his abuse of power. I think we're also winning with regard to cutting spending. Now, I'd be the first to tell you the sequester is not actually really cutting spending, but it is cutting the rate of growth of spending. It's, you know, I didn't vote for it because I didn't think it was enough, but now I'm trying to hold firm to it so we don't break the sequester and actually spend more than the sequester. But on the sequester, the president came to the country and said, the world will end, the sky is falling, it's a disaster, the airplanes are going to crash into each other. We're going to have to lay off the air traffic controllers. The meat's going to be rancid. We're going to have to lay off the meat inspectors. And I was like, really? The first thing you're going to do is lay off the air traffic controllers? And you're in charge of the country? There's a lot of things that could be cut. And I've given him some suggestions. If you simply just don't rehire people, that saves $6 billion a year. That many people retire from the federal government every year. $6 billion worth. Just don't rehire people. If you were to have competitive contracts, meaning that you would think we'd go with the cheapest bid, we don't. We go with the cheapest bid, but we factor in prevailing wage, which is sometimes twice what the normal wage would be. So if you're gonna build a federal project in this part of Virginia and you pay a carpenter $30 an hour, if it's a federal product project, it might be $60 an hour. That alone, if you would do competitive wagings, wages and competitive bidding for all the government, that's $10 billion. The money adds up. There's $100 billion unaccounted for. They have no idea where the money is. It's been spent. It may not have been stolen. Probably wasn't all stolen. But they have no idea where it's been spent. They cannot account for it. The Pentagon's never been audited. They say they're too big to be audited. So we got companies that are too big to fail, and we have government agencies that are too big to be audited. That's a problem. But there's money to be found. The president, I don't think, is really listening, but he's lost that argument. We won the argument that you can cut spending and the world won't end. Well, you can cut the rate of growth of spending and the world won't end. But the thing is, is we won that argument because he said there were dire circumstances. And there's still people floating around the uh, halls of Washington saying there's not enough money for defense and we won't be able to defend ourselves. So there's not enough money for social welfare and we won't be able to help people. 47 million people are on food stamps. You know, that's twice the number we had before. And I'm the first to say, you know, we can have some safety net. You can help those who can't help themselves. But I say, if you look like me and you hop out of your truck and you put a handicap sticker up there, and then you go get your disability check, that's a problem. And that's what we've got, is we've got a nation now where we've encouraged this to happen. But the sequester went by and the world didn't end. The world didn't end. We were able to do this. All these government agencies says they were going to furlough people. They scared all their government employees to death that this was the end. Turns out the other day, last week, there was an article that said like six or seven agencies that said they were going to furlough people. None of them ended up having furloughs. It's amazing when, you're, when push comes to shove what you can find to cut. Finally, I think if we want to grow the Republican Party, that may not be everybody's objective here, but it is my objective. <laughs> if we want to grow the Republican Party, I think we need to pay attention to some of the liberty issues. One of the big issues from the liberty crowd has been indefinite detention. And when we passed it, the president, and this is really my main problem with the way the president thinks about issues, he, he thinks of himself as a good person and so, oh, I would never detain anyone. But it's not really the way we've run our government. You know, in the past, Madison said that if a government were comprised of angels, we wouldn't really need the Constitution. We really wouldn't need these restraints on politicians. But it isn't about President Obama. It really isn't. It isn't about who the current president is. It is about allowing anybody to accumulate that much power. It's why I was asking him. I didn't really think he was going to drone people, or as my wife keeps reminding me, I said, during someone's cafe experience and ruin their cafe experience. I didn't really think he would do that. But at the same time, why wouldn't he explicitly admit he didn't have the authority to do that? So it's important not for him just to say he's not gonna detain somebody, it's important for him to say he doesn't have the authority to detain someone without a trial, without a lawyer, without a jury verdict. And so this is an important issue. How is it an issue bigger than just for libertarians? It's an issue because I think this is an issue that we should take to communities that haven't been considering us. Think about it. Who in our system, who in our, who in our, our country has been treated unfairly by justice? 
more than anybody else, African Americans. They're arrested disproportionately for drug crimes. The war on drugs has now made one out of three African American males a felon. They go to jail, then they get behind on child support and they get out, and a day later they arrest them for not paying their child support. How are you supposed to catch up if it, well, you're in jail for three or four years for a nonviolent drug crime? You get out, you owe $3,000. You can't get a job because you're now a convicted felon. You get a job for $9 an hour, and they say, oh, you owe $4,000. And if you don't pay it, you're going back to jail. You can see how this cycle of poverty and the cycle of the war on drugs is hurting a certain group in our society more than others. I would say if we reach out and say, we're going to fix this, so this week I went to make a step forward and I testified against mandatory minimums. These are the laws that say, if you're caught with possession of drugs, you get 10 years automatically, or sometimes more. There was a fellow by the name of John Horner. He's 46 years old and he had a bunch of pain med medicine at home and he thought he'd make a little extra money and he sold it to a friend. I'm not condoning that. Turns out though the friend was an informant. He got 25 year mandatory minimum sentence. He's 46 years old with three kids. He may never see his kids again outside of prison. He'll be close to 80 years old when he gets out. Uh, another young man uh, by the name of uh, Edward Clay, 18 years old, first offense for marijuana, got 10 years in prison. Another young man, Weldon Angelos, 24 years old, got 55 years in prison. It was his third time to be caught, so three strikes, you're out but all of his crimes were nonviolent sale of marijuana. It's ruining people's lives, it's unjust, unfair, and if we become the party of justice, the party that believes that criminal laws should be just, that penalties should be proportionate to the crime, I think we can get people to come to our party because I don't think the Democrats have done anything on these issues for years. If you think about indefinite detention, the idea, and I had this debate with John McCain on the floor and I said, you mean you could send an American citizen to Guantanamo Bay without a trial, with, without a jury, without a lawyer, without anything? He says, yeah, if they're, if they're dangerous. <laughs> it, it, it begs the question, who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? The Wall Street Journal editorialized against me and said, well, yeah, if they're enemy combatants. Sure, we should detain them. It's like, who gets to decide? And you might be a little bit worried when the criteria for who is a terrorist seems to be fairly expansive. Having more than seven days worth of food is one of the criteria for being a terrorist. Having multiple weapons at home, anybody, we won't ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> Likes to pay in cash. Has changed the color of your hair recently. We're not gonna get too personal here. Stains on your clothing means you might be making bombs. Uh, missing fingers. Anybody ever met a farmer who might be missing a finger? You know, the thing is, is that it's ridiculous. If these are the criteria for suspecting people, wouldn't you at least want a trial and a lawyer and a jury trial before you get sent to Guantanamo Bay? So I think these kind of issues can resonate with communities beyond who the typical, you know, uh, Republican community has been. Because when you think about it, think back to the Olympic bombing. You remember Richard Jewell? Everybody said he was guilty. Well, it turns out he wasn't guilty. Imagine if he'd been a black man in 1920, what would have happened to him? There have been times in our history when we haven't done the right thing. That's why we have to be careful to do the right thing, because if you ever get a time in history where you allow that much power to accumulate, that's when you worry what could happen to people. And African Americans ought to be concerned. Jewish Americans ought to be concerned. Anybody who's ever been part of an ethnic group that was abused and vilified by government and treated unfairly ought to be concerned about allowing your government to, be, to indefinitely detain somebody, even if they say they'll never use it. I think there are all kinds of ways that we can expand and grow the party. And I think instead of the libertarian aspect of the Republican Party being a detriment, I think it's actually become full circle and it really is the way the Republican Party will grow. And I think... <laughs> the, uh, right after the Boston bombing, I was at a... Um, a function in, in Louisville, and there was a policeman there from uh, the Boston Police Department, and he was there as one of the first responders, and he said, 
when the bombs exploded and it was like a war zone, there were limbs strewn everywhere, people bleeding to death, and he responded and he was applying tourniquets and he was part of that first response team. And it was just, it was, it filled him with horror that someone would do this, that someone in the name of religion or politics would blow up innocent people. And he said he was also part of the manhunt. He said he was also there, one of them was shot. He didn't have a problem with that. We, we do shoot criminals when they're, when they're fleeing. But when we captured the other one, when he was disarmed, he said what separates us and what makes us different from them is that we didn't beat the guy to death with tire irons. We took him to jail. In all likelihood, he is guilty. I mean, there's a lot of evidence out there. But we're going to give him a trial. He's going to get a lawyer. We do this with the worst, most despicable people. Terrorists are bad people. So are rapists. So are murderers. But nobody's proposing we don't have trials for them. I think it is what separates us. I think if we approach these issues with passion and zeal, the passion and zeal to defend basic justice, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution, I think we will be the winning party. Thank you very much.